Hello, I'm Kevin Houston, and you're watching my second video on writing mathematics to accompany my book, How to Think Like a Mathematician. In the previous video on writing mathematics, we looked at the basics, such as writing in sentences and punctuation. In this video, we will look at what to call things, use of symbols, and proofreading. Let's get on. Mathematics is full of formulas and equations, so many beginners call any collection of symbols a formula or an equation. This is incorrect. Definition. Generally, a collection of symbols is called an expression or term. For example, 3x squared minus 7x is an expression. It is not a formula or an equation. An equation involves stating that two expressions are equal. For example, 3x squared minus 7x equals 4x. Note that an inequality, such as x less than or equal to 5, is not an equation, as an equation should be an equality. Definition. A formula expresses some relationship or rule. It is often used when a method of calculating something from another expression is given. For example, for studying ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, we look at d equals square root of b squared minus 4ac to determine whether the roots are real, repeated or complex. This is the formula for d, sometimes known as the discriminant. A formula usually involves an equality. For example, the formula for the roots of the equation ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0 is given by the equality x equals minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Everyone knows that symbols are an important part of mathematics. The following tips will help you include them correctly in your written work. Number one, do not begin sentences with symbols. Thus, the next sentence should not be used. F is a function with domain R. This avoids violating the rule that every sentence begins with a capital letter. There are many ways to rewrite the sentence. A good example is, the function F has domain R. This avoids the problem by using a description of the object the symbol represents, i.e. the function f. Another possibility is the domain of f is r. The rule holds even if the symbol is a capital letter. A bad example is x is a finite set. We can write this better as the set x is finite. Another good reason for not using a symbol at the start of a sentence is that the full stop is also used as a shorthand for multiplication. So we could have sentences like, suppose that x is an element of x dot x is not in y. The sentence may be read as having x times x in the middle, which can be confusing. There are many ways to rewrite the sentence. Here is just one. Suppose that x is an element of x and little x is not in y. Another easy approach to avoid symbols at the start of a sentence is to employ phrases like we have. So rather than g of x equals 2x to the power 4 minus 5x minus 3, we can write we have g of x equals blah blah blah. Some symbols are given a common fixed meaning. For example, pi represents the circumference of a circle divided by its diameter. However, pi can mean other things as well. E.g. it is often used for a projection map, since pi represents p, and p is the first letter of projection. It is also used for the fundamental group of a space in algebraic topology. Other symbols, such as epsilon, usually mean a small positive number, n is a natural number, and so on. Get to know these conventions and use them as they make your work easier to read. Many symbols get used for certain objects. For example, f regularly denotes a function. And you may notice in the book that I use capital letters, such as capital X and capital Y, for sets and lowercase letters, such as little x and little y, to denote the elements of those sets. Despite these conventions, you should define your notation so that it is totally unambiguous, since a reader may use a different notation to you. Thus write, let x be a set, rather than just use x without explanation. Some notation does not need introduction. Most mathematicians will understand what pi stands for, provided it is in context, and we'll know that sigma refers to summation. The integral sign refers to integration, and so on. 
Before submitting an assignment or sending an email, you should proofread it. That is, deliberately look for errors while reading it. These could be typographical errors, also known as typos. Here the wrong character is used, e.g. K instead of cat. Spelling mistakes, e.g. parallel instead of parallel. Grammatical mistakes, e.g. a herd of cows are in the field. Herd is singular. Or even mathematical errors. While we're on the subject of mathematical errors, maybe a few words are in order. Spotting mathematical errors is of course hard and comes with experience, but the experience will come faster if you consciously look for the errors. First, does the answer make sense? Is it of the right order? If you have calculated that your car is travelling at a million miles an hour, or that the sun is 299 kilometres from the earth, as one of my students did, then it is unlikely that your answer is correct. Now, it may be difficult to solve an equation, but often it is almost trivial to put back the solution into the equation to check. For example, suppose we calculate that x equals minus 3 is a solution of 2x squared minus x minus 10 equals 0. We can check this easily. Put the x into the left-hand side and see if 0 comes out. 2x squared minus x minus 10 equals 2 times minus 3 squared minus minus 3 minus 10. And that equals 2 times 9 plus 3 minus 10. So I get 18 plus 3 minus 10, which is 11. And that's not equal to 0. Thus our calculation was wrong. x equals minus 3 is not a solution. We can make similar checks for solutions of differential equations. Also, if we integrate a function little f to get capital F, then differentiating capital F must give little f. This provides a simple check of integrals and is worth doing. One interesting byproduct of this type of checking is that it sharpens our intuition without us realizing. One exercise that I set in my first year geometry class is worth repeating. It's an easy problem in trigonometry. I can't remember who told it to me, so my apologies to them for not giving them credit. The exercise is, suppose that the sun rises at 6 a.m. and is directly overhead at noon. It is morning and you're on flat level ground. The length of your shadow is three times your height. What time is it to the nearest minute? Students have given various answers over the years. For example, 3 p.m. Well, the problem said it was morning, so it can't be 3 p.m. in the afternoon. 5.11 a.m. Well, you have a shadow, but the sun has not yet risen. That can't be right. 11.58 a.m. Now, Thinking about this, your shadow will not be three times your height at nearly midday when the sun is directly overhead. This should give you some idea of the checking process. Back to proofreading. First, read your work slowly. Reading aloud can help catch many errors as it stops you skimming. Two, get someone else to read your work as you will often read what you think is there rather than what actually is there. Now, if your checker misses mistakes, then you're not allowed to blame them. The final responsibility always rests with the writer. Third, concentrate on one aspect of proofreading at a time. So you should read through first for accuracy, i.e. is what you have written true. Next, check for spelling, typos, are all the brackets closed, etc. Then check that the order of the material is correct and that it flows as you read it. Okay, now for some conclusions. Not everything is a formula, call things by their correct name. Don't begin a sentence with a symbol. Use common symbols and notation. Define your symbols and notation. Proofread. Check that your answers make sense. Well, it would seem I have run out of time. In the video Writing Mathematics 1, I said I would talk about the curse of the implication symbol. I guess that that will have to be on a different video. Thanks for watching.